Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today at this event from PDPAL Project Consortium. Uh, PDPAL Project is about palliative care in Parkinson's disease and is funded by the Horizon 2020 program of the European Union. We are pleased to have today Sandra Martins Pereira, an outstanding figure in the field of palliative care. And the focus of today's webinar will be advanced Parkinson's disease, death and dying. I will now give a brief introduction about our project. The PDPAL project is a still an ongoing project that we land this year. Uh, during this year, we, um, we decided to start this project focusing on palliative care in Parkinson's disease, as it is one of the scenario in which those needs to be improved and spread. In fact, uh, PD patients have considerable and mounting unmet physical, uh, uh, psychosocial and spiritual needs, and they experience great problems with coordination and continuity of care. We have to face different barriers and challenges, and one of them is a linguistical one. In fact, palliative care is often understood as a synonymous event of life for terminal care. Our overall ambition is to validate a new model of palliative care that needs to be integrated in the traditional management, not only in late stage PD. Our consortium consists of 10 different partners uh, across 10 Euro uh, southern European countries, we have also a different partnership and endorsement with different European uh, Association of Parkinson and other um, European funded projects also focused on Parkinson, like AKRPT. Our objectives are to draft guidelines and recommendations to understand better when palliative care needs to be addressed and delivered. We have also a clinical study focused on the, on the delivery of uh, community care based on a nurse intervention that aims not only at taking better control of symptoms in everyday life, but is also allowing um, patients and their caregivers to think about disease trajectory, disease course, and also express their will. We, have also, uh, we are also pursuing an educational path. So, uh, so far we have developed a massive online open course for not only uh, neurologists and uh, palliative care specialists, but also for patients and caregivers, and all the healthcare professionals that want to um, address this. So if you, want, uh, if you go to our site, bdpal.eu slash book, you will find all the information you need. Uh, I want to thank again all the partners and um, association that are sustaining us. And now I will leave the stage to Dr. Pereira. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. And uh, thank you, Pirit, also for this invitation and this nice introduction to the PDPAL project, uh, which is certainly a very relevant project in not only in the European arena, but uh, internationally. Um, it's uh, very important, I think, and we all recognize the importance of palliative care in Parkinson's disease. So thank you all the to all the consortium for all your hard work in running this uh, very important project. Um, you have asked me to share a little bit uh, some experience and some thoughts about uh, the topic of advanced Parkinson's disease, death and dying, a bioethical perspective in clinical research. Um, and this is going to be the core focus uh, of, uh, of my presentation, where I will uh, share some of our previous work uh, on uh, clinical research in palliative care and patients with cognitive impairment, including patients with advanced Parkinson's disease. The outline of the presentation uh, is the one that I'm sharing with you in this slide. Um, we will go mainly through three uh, topics. Um, I will share with you some of the findings from a previous European project, uh, which was called Ensure. Uh, enhancing the informed consent process and supported decision making and capacity assessment in clinical dementia research. And I will make an effort to establish the linkages between Project Ensure and the PDPAL project. 
um, which is also, I think, important to capitalize on previous research and establish linkages between different projects that are funded by the European Union and the European Commission. Um, in the second part, I will share with you some of the ethical issues and challenges when conducting research with persons with cognitive impairment. And those challenges are not only uh, specific to research, of course, there are specificities, but they are transferable to the clinical context as well. And finally, some ethical challenges specifically in clinical research and palliative care for patients with cognitive impairment. Um, just very briefly to set up the scenario, uh, this is a, an infographic of palliative care, end of life care, terminal care, and if we link it to palliative care and Parkinson disease, uh, I would say that most of these elements are familiar to all of us and the need to promote palliative care for patients with Parkinson disease. Uh, from an early stage in the development of the disease and throughout the disease trajectory till we reach the end of life. Uh, I think that nowadays is more than recognized and the effort is to find the best way and uh, to show through research the importance of providing palliative care to these patients. And that's the scenario I would say in which uh, the PTPAL project is built. Um, and now I will try to establish those linkages between the PDPAL project and the need of uh, the informed consent process, both in clinical practice and in clinical research for these patients, establishing, taking into account these different projects. Um, just to share very briefly with you, this project, uh, Project Ensure, had the objective to provide interdisciplinary recommendations for an action model uh, of an informed consent process in clinical dementia research. We aimed to enhance the capacity to consent as far as possible to allow for patient autonomy. Uh, the other objective was to improve the assessment of decision-making capacity, which still poses challenges in clinical practice and also for research. Another objective was to protect those who do not have the capacity to consent, while at the same time, we aim to guarantee a fair subject selection and inclusion criteria in clinical dementia research. So to establish here the balance between protecting those who are more vulnerable and who lack the capacity to consent, while at the same time, including them in relevant research that can also improve their well-being. Uh, the project had four interlinked subprojects that provided a different core set of uh, recommendations. One was on gerontology, another one was uh, on law, taking into account the legal aspects of informed consent and mental capacity. And in between those broad areas, we had two subprojects that were focused more on ethical issues. Uh, one that was more focused on conceptual aspects of the informed consent, and the other one of the ethical challenges that uh, emerged in clinical dementia research, identifying strategies that could help to improve the informed consent process. So basically, if we look at the basic principles uh, of research ethics and also of healthcare, uh, we have the ethical principle of autonomy, which is paramount, and it requires a proper informed consent. Uh, nevertheless, and this is part of the ethical challenges, a valid informed consent only happens if the person is competent to participate in the decision-making process and particularly in research, if the person is competent to participate in the study. At the same time, we know that usually uh, the informed consent is the most scrutinized and controversial aspect of clinical research ethics. Um, nevertheless, we also know that uh, the informed consent is more than ticking the box of having a signed form. It's indeed a process that should happen throughout the whole research trajectory. Um, persons are competent to participate in a research study if, and only if, they are sufficiently able to understand the nature, methods, benefits of the research, if, and only if, they appreciate the effects of research participation on their own personal situation, if, and only if, 
uh, they process the disclosure information in a rational way. And finally, if and only if they are able to express a choice about their own participation in the research project. When we look at the continuum of cognitive impairment in persons with Parkinson disease, we realize and evidence shows that uh, there is uh, um, a progress from a normal cognition to mild cognitive impair impairment till a situation in which patients are uh, co uh, cognitively impaired and also with dementia. So we also know that dementia is a risk factor for incompetence and persons with dementia due to Parkinson's disease, as well as other persons who score below 18 in the mini mental state examination, that they are either incompetent or only marginally competent to consent to their participating, participation in research studies. Evidence also shows that according to the le relevant legal criteria, a large proportion, very large, uh, of persons with mild to moderate dementia are incompetent to consent to research participation. Yet, we also know that these people need to be involved in relevant research that can benefit their well being and their quality of life. Um, Looking now at the decision-making capacity, in clinical research with persons with advanced Parkinson's disease and dementia, assessing decision-making capacity may sometimes be challenging because the nature and the progress of the disease influences the decision-making capacity in different ways. We also know that persons with advanced uh, Parkinson's disease and also with dementia represent a vulnerable population that deserves special attention, especially when developing, implementing and evaluating the informed consent process, not only for research, but also for healthcare provision. So we are commonly confronted with an ethical di dilemma. On the one hand, we have the ethical imperative to conduct clinical research with persons with advanced Parkinson's disease and dementia, because we need to alleviate the burden of the disease and improve their quality of life and well-being. But on the other hand, it seems ethically impermissible to include incompetent per persons in this type of research. So how do we solve this ethical dilemma? According to the international framework for biomedical research and clinical research, the absolute requirement of actual consent logically excludes incompetent persons from participation. But then again, this poses another ethical challenges because if these patients are excluded from participating in research, then the care that we are providing is not evidence-based, which might increase their own vulnerability. So this international framework, when I'm talking about therapeutic research, consider that biomedical research is therapeutic when the ratio of expected benefits and burdens of research participation is more favorable than any of the established treatment alternatives. When focusing on non-therapeutic research with um, Incompetent, uh, involving co incompetent population, the same international framework consider that it is permissible only if consent is given, in this case by a legally authorized representative, if research participants are involved in the decision-making process at the level of their ability, if there is participants assent to research part participation, and if the participant does not express, expressly dissent to research participation. So here we see already uh, some conditions that need to be taken into account. And basically there are some principles or standards that are established in order to promote this type of research. The first one is the principle of group benefit, which is when the research is intended to promote the health of persons with the same medical condition as the participant, meaning that the research might not benefit the person herself, but it might influence the common good and have a group benefit. The second, the subsidiarity principle, which means that the data cannot be obtained by means of research with competent persons. And for example, 
uh, when conducting end-of-life care research with patients who are no longer able to consent, this subsidiarity principle is particularly relevant to take into account. When the research involves only, only minimal risks and minimal burdens, as I mentioned before, which is the minimal risk standard, and both the research protocol and the informed consent process have to satisfy all other conditions that apply to any other ordinary, so to speak, biomedical research. So we know that we have ethical challenges and we have ethical issues when conducting research with persons with cognitive impairment. And therefore we aimed to provide perhaps not really answers to these issues and challenges because perhaps we ended up with more questions, but at least we tried to uh, build up um, some additional thoughts that could address these challenges. So what we know is that most of the time these patients, even when they have cognitive impairment or dementia, they might want to participate in clinical research. And we also know that patients at the end of life, including patients with advanced Parkinson's disease at the end of life, they might want or have, or have expressed sometime earlier in the disease trajectory altruistic reasons to participate in research. For example, when patients express things like, even if it won't help me, it might help someone else. So I, I indeed want to participate in this research. Or patients have the hope to medically benefit from a new treatment, a new care approach, um, something that might help them. And this is the immediate benefit. So the motivations for these patients to participate are very similar to the motivation of other patients to participate in research. Informed consent for research participation seeks to obtain the individual's authorization or the refusal for enrollment in clinical research. And a well-conducted informed consent process should ensure subject autonomy and address potential vulnerabilities when potential research participants are asked to participate in clinical research. And it's this, this aspect and the balance between autonomy while addressing potential vulnerabilities and how they might affect autonomy that is particularly relevant in this area of uh, healthcare provision and also in this area of research. So what is important is to take the ethical principle of autonomy into account and foster patient autonomy, both for research and clinical practice, while at the same time balancing it with the ethical principle of vulnerability and its various expressions. The criteria for a valid consent, both for research and clinical practice, is to be given adequate information about the nature and purpose of proposed treatments, as well as the risks, benefits, and alternatives to the proposed therapy, including no treatment at all. Another criteria is to be free from any sort of coercion. And finally, to have medical decision capacity, which, as we saw before, might be a particular challenge in advanced Parkinson's disease, particularly when the person already has some sort of cognitive impairment. The cognitive criteria for medical decision capacity relies on the ability to so a series of things. The ability to receive and understand relevant information, the ability to process this information, which is also the ability to reason about it, the ability to appreciate the situation and its consequences, the ability to weight benefits, risks, and alternatives, and the ability not only to make the choice, but to be able to communicate a, cho a choice. So if we look at all these abilities together, we can see how challenging it might be in certain conditions. There are several tools that can be used to help to, under, to measure the capacity to consent, both for research and clinical practice, but there is no unique gold standard. So this is only this tool, the MacArthur Competency Assessment Tool for Clinical Research is only one example of the tool that is used in various contexts, but at, as indicated, there is no unique gold standard. So what happens when we need to have the informed consent, either for clinical practice or for research. 
in a person without the capacity to consent. We have three possibilities. We have the proxy consent, which is when a legal authorized representative or the so-called surrogate decision maker is the one who provides the consent. We have the possibility of an advanced consent, which can be in the form of a research advanced directive. And finally, we have the supported decision-making, which is a more a relational approach, taking relational autonomy into account, where healthcare professionals support the patient, even without capacity to consent or with uh, cognitive impairment, in very creative ways sometimes, but supports the person in making the decision and in the decision-making process, trying to foster as much as possible autonomy and the capacity. Based on what I have been saying so far, um, we can see that the ethical issues and challenges in this area, particularly when conducting research with persons with cognitive impairment, are various. We have challenges in the research recruitment. We have challenges in the informed consent process and decision-making capacity that we can see here a very, a very a large list of uh, challenges in the informed consent process and decision-making capacity. We have challenges pertaining vulnerability in research. For example, not only group membership, where we see that persons who are identified as belonging to a specific group, for example, advanced Parkinson disease, persons with dementia, older people, all the people who are frail, persons with severe persistent mental illness or other groups that could have been added here. Just by being identified as belonging to these groups, people are recognized as being in a more vulnerable condition. Then we also have research-induced vulnerability, which can happen when materials or information about research are presented in a way that the participant can impossibly understand. And sometimes researchers use jar jargon as healthcare professionals do. Uh, they use very technical words and patients might not understand what we are saying. So this is really research induced vulnerability that we need to be careful with. Then we have situational vulnerability. All those tricky situations when the patient who we want to include in the research process is being cared for by the same healthcare professional who also embraces the role of research. So this ambiguity of role might create a situation of increased vulnerability. Or those situations where patients are economically disadvantaged and they are paid for participating in research or by being involved in the research project, they might have access to a treatment that otherwise they would not have. Another challenge, research advanced directly. On the one hand, we can think that they are wonderful because they can allow people to specify their willingness and conceptually they were created for people to be able to express in advance their preferences of care and also for research in this case. But at the same time, they can pose a challenge when research proxy have to act on behalf of the patient. So the use of a research advanced directive can allow uncertainty surrounding suitable choices and the coordination of proxy decisions with the wishes or values of persons with cognitive imp impairment might be challenging. Which takes us to another challenge, which is, which is responsible surrogate decision-making, where we need to be able both for research and also for clinical practice, to adequately handle the best interest and substituted judgments uh, where we need to ensure that we know that the proxy is really acting on behalf and on behalf of the best interest and is really proposing what the person would propose or would wish if she could be able to do so. And here we immediately can identify all those difficult communication situations with relatives, uh, with the healthcare team, with researchers, challenges in, in interpret, interpreting the advanced directives, challenges in deciding whether to follow or not to follow that, the content of the advanced directive. So here we can already see other challenges. And then 
the informed consent process itself to have a double consent, which is to obtain the consent from the proxy as well as assent from the person. Because even if the person is no longer able to express their consent, the person might still be able to assent or dissent. And it's up to healthcare professionals and also clinical researchers to be able to take this assent and dissent into account. And we should never forget that the informed consent is a process and it's a partnership of, cons of consent. It requires, what I said before, relational autonomy and it is established within a relational relationship in between a research and care continuum. Finally, we also need to take ethical guidelines and research into account and findings show a lack of consensus in ethical guidelines for involving persons with cognitive impairment in research and the confusion that this could cause across or between institution and particularly in international a collaborative project between different national boundaries. Which takes us to ethical questions. Usually I, uh, I make a joke with my, with my students and I say that if at the end of the, the course on ethics, they end up with more questions, then I'm a happy teacher. Uh, and indeed, uh, if we are able to pose more questions, it means that we reflected more deeply about the different, the different issues. So here, just uh, as a, an appetizer, um, we have a list of uh, different questions that are ethical questions when conducting research with persons with cognitive impairment. So what is the likelihood that the person with cognitive impairment will be competent to give the informed consent? Does the person have the capacity to understand and decide to be involved in that research process or not, or even to receive that specific treatment or care that is being offered? Is the person in a situation in which medical exigency prevents the education and deliberation needed to decide? Has the person a serious health-related condition for which there is no satisfactory solution? Is the person seriously lacking in important social goods that will influence the decision? Does the person belong to a group whose rights and interests have been socially disvalued? Is the person's differential behavior the so-called white coat syndrome, what masks an underlying unwillingness to decide. I would say that we all know those patients who rely on a more personalistic approach. The doctor knows the answer or the nurse knows the answer. They know better what is better for me. Or my husband knows better than, than myself to make certain decisions. He's the one who makes the decision or she it can also be the other way around. So deferential behavior, which is another uh, situation of increased vulnerability. Is the exclusion of research a harm to vulnerable people as they might be denied access to understanding how certain care interventions work for them in clinical settings? Are any potential research participants at risk of being harmed in any way by being included or by being excluded from participating in this research study? In case of advanced consent via an advanced research directive, how and in under what conditions should a revocation be accepted? Which expressions, for example, verbal, mimic, or gesticulatory, should be taken into account as expressions of an autonomous will? And should they be disregarded? And if so, when and why? how to best integrate diverse models of decision-making in clinical research with persons with cognitive impairment, and so on. I'm sure that by the end, we will have more questions to add. Which takes me slowly to the final parts of, uh, of this presentation, which is focusing on ethical challenges in clinical research and palliative care for patients with cognitive impairment, but also establishing the linkages with palliative care provision or care provision to patients with palliative care needs. And the two main ethical challenges that we identify for cognitive impairment and vulnerability and how to optimize the informed consent. 
in a systematic review of systematic reviews on the ethical challenges, for example, of outcome measures in palliative care clinical practice, we identify that the main ethical challenges was indeed cognitive impairment, particularly in patients with dementia. And the way of addressing these ethical challenges was mostly through the use of proxy measure, me measures. In another study that we conducted on how to optimize informed consent in patients with dementia, we aim to understand and assess palliative care professionals' views on informed consent in healthcare and also in research involving persons with dementia. We conducted interviews um, focused on the views and thoughts of these healthcare professionals on the actual practices of informed consent in clinical practice and in research, and measures that could be used to optimize the informed consent process and foster autonomy. As part of the interviews, we also used, uh, we included a questionnaire in which we asked these professionals to what extent they thought that, the, or they considered that the informed consent process was an effective practice in general healthcare provision, in specialist palliative care provision, in clinical dementia research, and in clinical trials. Our findings uh, suggested that for these professionals, respect for dignity was perceived as respect for autonomy. These professionals highlighted the impossibility to apply the informed consent process in face of cognitive impairment, which if we relate it to everything that I shared before about informed consent and ethical challenges and issues, um, we see that it's not really impossible. It might be more challenging, but it's not impossible. And the proxy consent via family carer was the preferred way to meet patients' wishes. Some professionals mentioned their efforts to involve the patient in the decision-making process. However, when asked about what type of measures do you use to involve the patient or to foster autonomy and informed consent process, um, they had to think a little bit and they considered that innovative measures, for example, visual aids were perceived as potentially useful, but not really used in their clinical practice or research. So based on this study, it came obvious for us at least that we need further research about the use of strategies to improve the informed consent process in palliative care and research involving persons with dementia, which can link very easily to cognitive impairment, for example, in Parkinson's disease, and that there is some potential in the use of innovative measures that need to be tailored for each situation, but that require more research on their applicability and usefulness. So based on our different studies, uh, more conceptual and also empirical, we came up with some recommendations to perform ethically sound clinical research with persons with cognitive impairments that we can link to palliative care, particularly in Parkinson's disease. Researchers are called to be aware that persons with cognitive impairment are individuals and they have to value, they have value to offer to the research arena. Researchers should also consider persons with cognitive impairment not only as subjects and research participants, but also as partners in the research process. Another recommendation is that a universal and ethical approach and policy recommendations to obtain informed consent and monitoring the appropriateness of research should be developed and it really needs to be far further developed. Another recommendation, informed consent processes and practices should be conducted using simple language, very plain, very simple, easy to understand. They should have a concise format. Um, we know that some legal requirements demand for very detailed informed consent forms, particularly if we are conducting some type of trial, but we need to complement these forms with concise formats, visual aids, tools that can really help people to understand uh, the message and the importance of the study and whatever risks it has. Giving patients and or relatives or legal guardians enough time to read the consent form carefully and discuss it with other family member or professional. 
Creative strategies can be used to optimize comprehension among frail persons with cognitive impairment, and these creative strategies can have multiple formats and media. Informed consent is a process, and it might require more than one short session for patients to absorb and understand research issue, but also clinical issues. A multi-faced decision-making model might be better serve the interests of persons with cognitive impairment who have lost the capacity to make decisions on their own. Guidelines on these ethics procedures are needed to address ethical issues and how to deal with them. And finally, scientific journals ought to include and request authors to provide more detailed information on ethics procedures and their guidelines for submissions. For example, it's no longer enough to write a very brief sentence saying, we obtain ethics approval from an ethics review board or from the clinical ethics committee. No, please do provide information on what ethics procedures did you ensure? And for the journals and for editors, please request this type of information because that's what makes it meaningful and relevant. Finally, just to systematize for key uh, messages to take home in terms of final recommendations based on the Ensure project that we are trying to link here with the PDPAL project and that is applicable in our perspective to palliative care for patients with advanced Parkinson's disease and cognitive impairment. One, enhance capacity to consent as far as possible. The, the consent is an expression of autonomy, so it's influenced by other ethical principles, and therefore we need to enhance it as much as possible. Two, improve assessments of decision-making capacity. We really need to improve those forms. There is no gold, specific gold standard. There are different tools, but we need to improve the assessment of decision-making capacity and integrate it into regular clinical practice and research. Third, protect those who do not have the capacity to consent. Vulnerability should be addressed from a practical point of view. It should be taken into account. The different types of vulnerabilities need to be taken into account, both for clinical care and for research. And sometimes the same person has different types of uh, vulnerability influencing their decision-making capacity. And finally, the last but not the least, we need to guarantee fair subject selection via our inclusion criteria and participation because we need to include patients who have cognitive impairment for research that is relevant for them, that is specific, really related to their own clinical condition, and that in the future that might help them individually, but also in the future help collectively other people who have the same or similar type of disease. So thank you very much for these different projects, projects that have been supporting the, our research. Thank you very much for the PDPAL project for including me and for the possibility to share these thoughts. I really look forward for the discussion that we will try to have now. And once again, thank you. Yes, Sandra, thank you so much for giving us a very detailed and specific overview about the subject that is that is absolutely not so clear as you presented right now, because uh, to every point that you made, probably you can make 10 other points and, and uh, the discussion will go on and on. Uh, but still, uh, um, so um, I, I try to go now back uh, and I made lots of notes. <laughs> uh, and the good thing about the webinars is that you can just go back and listen once more and, and see that how it was presented. But, um, but uh, you have been for a very long time in palliative care and, I, the, and you come from Portugal and Portugal has been one of those countries that has been actually uh, working on societal awareness about palliative care. So um, I know that you had already like 10 years ago or even longer ago this kind of national campaigns that what palliative care is and and so on so how have such campaigns actually affect the society and do you see that the patients are like uh, more compliant if you suggest them that let's try palliative care 
uh, in on the top of the tr normal treatments or or beside the normal treatments. Uh, thank you, Pirette, for this is a, for this challenging question because it uh, it really uh, makes me think, and I would say that if I share the question with my my colleagues here in Portugal, it will help us think on um, the result of certain actions that we do in a certain period of time and how it might influence things in the future. Um, I would say that uh, in Portugal, and I'm going to be specific now about Portugal, um, national campaigns uh, about palliative care have been held indeed over, I would say more, even more than the last 10 years, but at least uh, on the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day, there is always some type of campaign. At least once a year, everyone hears in the news, in the media uh, about palliative care. And uh, the society is much more aware of what palliative care is. And the society is aware that there is a national law that establishes the right of all citizens to have access to palliative care. Then. If we go to the next step, which is, okay, people know, but how does this translate into the reality of having access to? Then I would say that um, things have evolved. Um, sometimes uh, when people complain that, especially healthcare professionals, that uh, patients are still referred very late in the disease trajectory. Um, that there is still a large proportion of patients and families who do not have access to specialist palliative care. Um, then um, I usually say that these are no longer, and people say that palliative care is still very em embryonary in our country. Then I, I, I usually reply that if we were embryonary, then if, if palliative care was still an embryo, we will not be discussing early palliative care. We will still be discussing the need for palliative care. The point is when we are talking about early integration or timely, perhaps more timely than early access to palliative care, then we are already putting the discussion at the level of having a public health approach, a level of all health professional, healthcare professionals and even social care workers needing to have mandatory palliative care education as part of their undergraduate education and then have different levels of palliative care provision because some in some periods of time in the disease trajectory if we have a needs-based approach then a specific a patient might have the need at, from the diagnosis but for another patient it would not make sense it would only make sense at the end of life um, and one of my ethical concerns, I would say, is related, and this is perhaps for us to think as a palliative care community, is uh, while at the same time it's important to enlarge palliative care and ensure that patients have access to palliative care, even as an approach in earlier stages of the disease trajectory, if we, by broadening the concept of palliative care, we are not excluding those who are more vulnerable and at the end of life that end up not having access to specialist palliative care because they were referred to late and specialist palliative care professionals say, okay, now we cannot do anything that we would like to in terms of advanced care planning. But still, that patient is at the end of life, is more vulnerable, might benefit from the care that specialist palliative care teams might give or have to offer. And are we excluding those patients because we enlarge the concept to a point that we end up excluding those that are more vulnerable? But perhaps I'm just overthinking as bioethicists like to do. But um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question or if I'm- Well, you, you pointed out important words for the PDPAL project as well, because the, one of our uh, central Focuses has been also to try to make new recommendations in terms of timely access to palliative care services. And, uh, and uh, there is always this kind of discrepancy that patients uh, um, 
like feel that, that they are not there yet. And they say that also in terms of advanced care planning, they say that, oh, but maybe I will do it later. And we have also in our webinars have this, had this discussion that later, then sometimes when the crisis already is there, then it's just too late. And, um, and, uh, and so I think that what you said, uh, and also what is one of our uh, important goals here is this uh, providing uh, resources for educating oneself and understanding that when palliative care could be helpful, this kind of more multi-professional, comprehensive act, uh, ad, uh, way of addressing a disease or, or, uh, or um, uh, health-related suffering and, and where just one specialist can be helpful. So, so these are big questions. And yes, uh, enabling education is uh, part of our webinars. And, and so, uh, so just the, I think the, it's a still very much some, some kind of utopist thinking, but if each healthcare professional would have a solid education and understanding uh, of what palliative care is, and that is not only hospice care and and uh, and uh, yes, um, supporting people who are dying and or not leaving them without care, uh, then uh, then we would have maybe also le less pressure on those who are providing specialist palliative care, and maybe we would need less specialist care services. And if uh, generalists would be able to provide this uh, type of care. So, um, well, and of course, I think that if we look into the future and research where you maybe encourage people to think about their end of life and, uh, and what they want and what they don't want could be somehow burdensome. So what are your experiences with this kind of concerns? Well, uh, I think that in general, that concern exists, um, and it it has various levels. Uh, if you involve healthcare professionals, you might have a first. Those are the first gatekeepers, um, because immediately at that level, they will select what what patients to involve and what patients not to involve. When we think about the ethics committees, I think that if ethics committee, committees are well educated on ethics and research ethics, some of these problems would not occur because uh, at least uh, uh, that's what the message I was also trying to give in my presentation before, which is, of course, these patients are in a vulnerable condition people who are at the end of life, or even if they are not at the end of life, but people who are diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, a progressive disease, inevitably confronts the person, their loved ones, and even the professionals who care for them with the finitude. So with the fact that we all are vulnerable because we are intrinsically, we are vulnerable because we are human beings. Um, but there are situations where people get in a situation of increased vulnerability because they have a medical condition that poses that uh, threat of, uh, of the finitude in a more tangible way. On the other hand, so there is a concern about vulnerability. On the other hand, and being very pragmatic, if these patients are not involved in research, as participants, none of the care provided to those patients is evidence-based, which is also, if we want to put here uh, an ethical value, which is also not good for them because it might harm them if we don't study advanced care planning and we don't know whether or not it's effective, it's cost-effective, it, it benefits patients or not, we might be causing additional harm, but if we don't study that, we might be doing more harm than good. And then it's even worse because emotionally we might really be harming persons by confronting them with uh, plans for the future when they don't want to talk about plans for the future. And where there's no evidence that that intervention actually has a positive impact in patients if conducted in a certain way. 
So I would say that ethics committees also need to be educated about palliative care and palliative care research and how this research is needed like any other research to provide high quality and evidence-based care. And so if, so if ethics committees simply base their decision on this will harm the patient because the patient is at the end of life, so we will not involve the patient. They might be, they are first, they are basing their decisions on a bias, which is their own thoughts about how they will feel. And they are not addressing the fact that those patients might even be at risk of further harm if care is not provided based on evidence. So I think we also need to, to educate ethics committees on research ethics in palliative and end-of-life care. I think uh, that's very important because um, patients, the, the simple fact that the patient is in a situation of increased vulnerability should not prevent from research participation. What it needs is that researchers and clinicians who are also involved in the research process, take that vulnerability into account and define proper strategies to address that increased vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That, that requires more work from everyone. Yeah, <laughs> the easy way is to say it, he's too vulnerable, so it's a too, the, the situation is uh, causes suffering or might cause suffering. It's better not to do research. That's the easy way out. The difficult way out, the challenging way out is okay. Yes, there is an increased vulnerability. Yes, what do we do about yeah. it? What do we do about it? Yeah, and there is a sufficient amount of re research uh, output already that actually says that our own uh, worries about this uh, causing more harm um, are um, um, perceived by patients actually. Um, like not at all, they find it very nice that someone takes time for them, someone comes to them, talks to them and still finds them valuable and they can contribute. So I think that it is also some that our standards are, or we, we, we are afraid of causing more harm. But if we if we hear out the other party, then we hear that uh, that this uh, not as drastic as we believe it is to be. And uh, and people, this is, I think, something that palliative care stresses also people live until they are dead so um, <laughs> though, so we are not uh, studying dead and dying people we still uh, we are looking for ways to support people who are living and need our support yes but I, I have something that because so you know I am a researcher and um, more often and often I have made this kind of experiences myself and, and uh, with this patient population and in our study also, we were sending researchers uh, and nurses uh, primarily to visit patients in their homes. And um, I think that this is a question also for ethics committee that how do we protect the researchers and people who go alone and visit patients in their homes, because if you are part of the mobile palliative care team, then you usually go together. But in a research situation, um, you send people out there alone. And, uh, and if we have um, this kind of uh, population, I think it sounds a little bit scary, but we have people with cognitive impairments who might be also aggressive in a way. So, um, and so how do we pro protect the researchers? And in our study, for example, we train nurses how to communicate, but I don't think that we address the, the ethical aspect that how to protect yourself when you go alone and visit someone because the, maybe people have forgotten what's the purpose of your visit and, uh, and you know, everything can happen. So maybe you comment on that as well. I have only difficult questions for you, Sandra, yeah. because yeah. I like it so much. <laughs> those, are, those are the best questions because they help us to think together on, uh, on uh, how to do things in a, in a, diff in, in a different or even in, in the same way that we are doing, just validating, reassuring that we are doing them well. Um, I, I really don't have a straightforward answer to your question. Um, but what I think is that 
uh, especially if you if you if you lead a research team, perhaps as uh, team leaders, we need to think about those risks as part of the research design and uh, the research process. So, for example, the example that you just gave, it's true. If you're uh, doing research with uh, patients uh, who might have um, fluctuative uh, type of uh, cognitive condition, that when we had the first contact, the person was perfectly stable, was calm, was perhaps under the medication, at the peak of the medication, and uh, the person consented to participate. And then when we actually go to their house to make the interview, we are not sure how the person is going to be when we get there. It's the same as healthcare professionals when they go to patients' homes to provide care. But researchers might not be healthcare professionals, so they might not uh, be uh, familiar with uh, communication strategies and also they might not be prepared. So I would say that as research, as leaders of research teams, we need to reflect on this. I think we need to prepare those researchers for that. We need to enhance their communication strategy, which is all part of educating them. And perhaps also define strategies. If we know that that might happen, perhaps instead of going just one researcher, go two researchers, send two researchers, a colleague to go together with them so the person feels supported. In some of our research projects, um, I remember that we had more than for qualitative research doing interviews. We had two research re researchers going to conduct interviews, um, not only for research purposes, because it can help to validate uh, the content of, uh, of the interview, but also uh, in terms of um, relationship within the team of research researchers or also for this type of situations, it can help if you're not alone as healthcare professionals go on a team. But I would say that this is part of the preparatory work that we also need to think when we are preparing research. And it's a little bit in line with the last recommendations, the one for the scientific journals, that we also need to be more critical. And uh, uh, for example, in palliative medicine, I'm one of the screening editors and perhaps I'm <laughs> the most picky one uh, about the ethics procedures because we usually just write, we got ethics approval, end of the story. No, that doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> just tell me that you had an approval, but what were the ethical procedures? What did you do to address the ethical concerns? Um, and that's part, I think, of looking also at the big picture. So and thinking together, OK, the, this is a risky situation. How do we handle it and report it so others learn from it? And don't write just that small sentence. Perhaps it's important to write, OK, you got ethics approval. And because we knew that there were some risks associated with this research and communication is important, instead of going one researcher, there were two. Things like that, those details. Yeah, so uh, if you have a multi-site study in seven uh, uh, European countries, then you basically could write probably an entire article based on uh, what you had to consider, because you mentioned also that the law and legal aspects are so different. And, and um, because this is like, uh, even though, yes, uh, of course, uh, our project might have global importance, but it is a European project. And this has been a big a big learning curve for all, also for us, how different are the legal aspects in the countries and the, all this kind of, our main purpose is advanced care planning. And then uh, it, it turns out that this advanced care planning is like European tax law, that if you uh, suddenly fall ill in another country, then it is nil and void uh, what you have filled out with. Mm -hmm cautiousness and care in another country. So um, as someone responsible for ethics in entire Europe, uh, and also considering this advanced care planning uh, research that we do, and so many research groups now deal with it. And I also think that we should um, collaborate even more on this uh, just and focus and, and share our, our, our experiences. But how do you comment on this, that what, what should we, we do to make this advanced care planning uh, 
so that it is, uh, if you live in one country and decide to die in another country, you could still just easily cross the border and it wouldn't cause you um, so much trouble. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, have the linguistic issue as well there at the top of it. I think. Yeah, I was just thinking about the linguistic issues uh, when you were uh, uh, when you added it. So we had a, um, a telepathic communication right now about the language issues. Um, I would say that we have challenges. Europe is the same continent. We have the European Union, European Commission. Um, but at the end of the day, indeed, each country has different um, laws. And um, for example, from an ethical point of view, we have, and legal, they are, they are linked here, we have the advanced directives that are legally binded. And then we have the advanced care planning plans that in some countries, they are not legally blinded. They are part of the care process. If they are well documented, they are communicated to uh, from across settings in the same country. But then if we cross the border, probably I'm in Portugal, if I cross the border to Spain, in Spain, they don't have access to my Portuguese clinical record unless I have it with me and I'm able to share it uh, with uh, the Spanish healthcare professionals who will care for me in Spain and the other way around it's exactly the same um, so we we will still have and uh, uh, I don't know how or if it will ever be solved but we still have uh, these legal and uh, cross-border healthcare issues that these type of projects help to address they help to even show that there are challenges. I don't want to call them problems. I really want to call them challenges because it means that we can find strategies to, to, to solve them. Um, but right now, we don't have the solutions yet. Uh, and uh, even to obtain ethics approval, we know from other European projects, and even in this one, the ensure that was about informed consent and different specifically about that. And uh, we realize that even to obtain ethics approval to run a simple study, in some countries it would take uh, less than one month because according to their law, they have very specific criteria on when to obtain, when there is the need to have an ethics approval by an ethics committee, etc. And in other countries, it might take six and sometimes nine months. And that's a challenge even to progress with the research process. And I'm sure that in PDPAL, those type of challenges must have happened because you have so many different countries. <laughs> so, that's and it happens yes. every time. Um, so thinking forward, perhaps, <laughs> research proposal this should not be recorded <laughs> um but no it's a, it's an open thought perhaps we really need to do research also about that on um, the challenges um, ethical and legal challenges uh, that international collaborative cross-country cross-border research in healthcare poses and ways to solve it uh, otherwise it, it will I can have an advanced care planning here. I can have an advanced directive in Portugal. I go to Austria or uh, to Germany and beside the language barrier, <laughs> the, it will not be valid there because I didn't do yes. it there. And the other way around too. Yeah, so you mentioned like that uh, there are these um, ways if you approach the patients, then you have to check the ability to appreciate and the ability ability to communicate. So maybe it is also for researchers that uh, that instead of making these 70 pages advanced care planning uh, plans that are not even legally binding, maybe we should think more into the direction of pocket cars where you have a picture that it identifies something and we either do like yes or no for this and we can all the time renew it and as long as we are still able to make these decisions and so that these cards are readable even if uh, if the language barrier is there so um yeah yeah you just had, had another idea or another research project yeah things like that um make things 
more practical, more feasible, translatable to other contexts and see if it's effective or not, because yeah, that's research. Yeah. Um, well, I, I am uh, sorry that because I, I have just one question. You mentioned socially disvalued groups. Maybe our uh, listeners and learners want to know what groups are those? All those groups that because of their socioeconomic condition are in a more vulnerable situation. It's sometimes uh, it's a, it's related to the mostly to the social determinant social demographic determinants of health, the socioeconomic and economic determinants of health that in certain situations people end up belonging. That, that's why I deviated also a little bit from the groups because the groups the concept of group might stereotype stereotype situations, uh, but there are. Um, uh, there are persons that, uh, because of those social, cultural, social, demographic, and socioeconomic situations or determinants, are in a more vulnerable condition. Um, people who are more poor, who are in an economic, more disadvantaged situation. Um, people who are even less, they have, they are less, uh, they have less health literacy and they end up being more vulnerable because of that. Um, in, in other countries, perhaps, or in other situations, uh, people who, I don't want to, to uh, I really don't want to get into the, I, I know it's in the slide with groups because um, that's the way it's framed in the literature. But um, I avoid using the group concept because it stereotypes uh, for people and I don't like to stereotype it in any specific way. But I would say that it also depends on each society and each, on each country where we know that because of those determinants, people are in a vulnerable situation. Um, even geographically, because of the place where they live, they have less access to healthcare or in general or to palliative care in particular um, and I think in each country those groups might have similarities but might also have difference that's why I'm avoiding to uh, to really stereotype them because yeah. but it, uh, it again calls of course healthcare professionals as well as a decisions uh, to think that uh, if there is or reflect on if we are biased uh, also, because now you uh, uh, masterfully avoided mentioning any group, but uh, usually research uh, mentions a specific group as a, a particularly vulnerable, and sometimes it might not even be true. So, uh, yeah, that's why I'm, I, I'm refraining myself from naming those groups because um, I might be unfair by naming them, but. Uh, it's all those situations where because of social conditions, economic, demographic, geographic, uh, people, persons, in, individually or families or groups end up being in, in a more vulnerable situation. And for example, if I identify here the community where I live, I can identify certain persons that I know that for sure will be in a more vulnerable condition. But on the other hand, it's not because they belong to that group that makes them necessarily vulnerable. So that's why I'm not really, I don't want to identify specifically because I might be um, unfair by doing it. Yeah, we have had the discussions here in webinars, for example, women being more, more vulnerable. So uh, I can start there, uh, let's say, but it's not always, of course, like this. Yeah, but that's why I'm, I'm, I'm for example. Yeah, but I, I just put it out there because I know that well, in our lessons, well. we, we discuss people with ethnic background, we dig, they discuss black and brown majorities. So people might be also, Perfect. if they look at their... You know, we have listed some groups as well. Yeah, but that's but that's precisely what I'm trying not to do. And I think it's very clear that I'm not doing it deliberately because I think that when we actually list groups, we might miss those who are vulnerable because we are grouping. And just because, for example, I'm female, 
I'm not disadvantaged at all. I'm not more vulnerable because I'm a woman, because I have other determinants that make me be more informed, more empowered. I have a series of other characteristics that make me not be so vulnerable. Perhaps I have a neighbor who is more vulnerable than I, who is a male who might be more vulnerable than I. And so that's why Absolutely. I'm avoiding those. So it's, it's, <laughs> health is a very complex issue and the illness is a very complex issue. And though the, how we dis, uh, define someone as vulnerable uh, is a yeah. mixture of uh, uh, social determinants, economical determinants, and so on and so on. Personal and so characteristics, uh, family characteristics, um, and perhaps I'm, I'm a bit you topic about it and perhaps also because I grew up in a multicultural context um, I really look at people as who they are and not the group they belong to so uh, you are Pirit the person as a person I know you as a person and I want to know you as a person not because you're a woman and therefore you're more vulnerable not because you're black or white and therefore you're more protected or you're black and therefore you're more vulnerable no I look at you and I see period I don't see gender I don't see and perhaps I'm utopic but if I'm utopic at my age then I think I should be happy <laughs> yeah so uh, yes, being idealistic is always a good thing. In the, I think everybody who works in palliative care is carrying this uh, <laughs> idealism in their hearts. And I think this person-centered care, this has been also my main message where I have been studying people with migration history, saying that they might be sometimes much more resourceful than those because they have information from different countries at their disposal for example how to deal with this disease so so yes it is more complex as we perceive and it's all about also because this is this um, uh, webinar with you has been very much about uh, also calling for self-reflections within us researchers and and clinicians who do the research so that not we'd say that, oh, this is interesting and we do it, but like really how to do it so that we don't, um, uh, yeah, we don't work with ready-made groups that not even might uh, be a group, so to say. And one to the last comment, you said the health literacy and one very interesting minor detail that uh, people not knowing what palliative care is, is a much, stronger barrier to access in palliative care than the their educational level so just a very minor detail yes. from my research so thank you so much sandra is there something that i did not ask but you just want to put out there because you think that oh everybody needs to hear this as well <laughs> uh, we already covered so many things um just um Perhaps uh, not a specific, perhaps one specific thought about uh, these webinars. Um, I saw the previous webinars that are available on YouTube. That's why I changed slightly the direction and tried not only to look at uh, ethical challenges at the end of life that are usually very, they are already well discussed in the literature, but link it to the research that we are conducting. And this is a European funded project. So as researchers and palliative care researchers, the boundaries between research and clinical practice that are intertwined. So uh, that would be a specific one, a broader one, just for all those working in palliative care research and education and policy um, that um, continue being idealistic, and uh, moving the field forward because at the end that's what matters and it was a pleasure to be here with you um so uh, thank you very much <laughs> whatever i might be i don't know if it's still recording but whatever i might be useful and collaborations now and in the future happy to collaborate it's a small area so we all are needed with our different roles and our different features. Thank you so much for your talk.